Hi, this is Robert Roundtree with the Marijuana Solution, and we're dedicated to the medicated. That's why today we have a very special guest, Mitch Santel of Stoner Studio and Big Reggae Mix. We're going to be talking with him about a bunch of things related to cannabis and get into some more of the outside fringes of the universe with you. So listen up. Mitch is a wealth of information. He's been a producer for three decades, over three decades, maybe four actually. Sorry about that, Mitch. Uh, We're going to have links to how you can connect with Mitch, Stoner Studio, and Big Reggae Mix in the comment section. And like always, remember to share and like this and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks and enjoy the show. Uh, How are you doing today, Mitch? I'm doing just fabulous, and if I were any better, there'd have to be two of me. Do you think the world's ready for two of you yet? I don't know. You know, it's I just go one step at a time. I just wanted to thank you very much for having me on your show today and, and reaching me reaching out to me on Twitter and all that good stuff. So I'm here to here to give you whatever feedback you need and share our story and promote what you're doing as well. Excellent. Yeah. So for everyone listening, I ran into what Mitch is doing with Stoner Studio and also another project of his big reggae mix on Twitter. Uh, social media is great because I get to meet really cool people like Mitch. Um, Mitch, could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the music industry and maybe just a quick synopsis, bring us up to speed? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the two-hour version in three minutes, if that's okay. So uh, That's how we like it's it. It's going to sound like a commercial, but it's not meant to, okay? okay. Um, basically, our family immigrated from Poland in 1899, and uh, my grandfather was – and they ended up moving to San Francisco. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1900 in San Francisco, and my – Great uncle was born in Poland in 1895. Uh, From 1914 to 1946, my grandfather and my great uncle were a very famous uh, directing team in Hollywood. Uh, They started the careers of David Niven and Red Skelton, and Marion Davies was my dad's godmother. Uh, When my grandfather and my great uncle left the film business in 1946, Uh, My grandfather was offered a directing job at Paramount Television because they were developing television. Uh, And my great uncle um, uh, retired and fell in love with the Japanese uh, woman, Yoshiko, and moved to Osaka, Japan. My grandfather, then having left the film business, um, decided to go into the retail record business. And so from 1955, oh, wow. yeah, so from 1955 <laughs> uh, to 1976, my grandfather and my father owned three small retail record stores called Marty's Music. We had one store in West Covina, one store in Hacienda Heights, and one store in Inglewood, California. They were all in Inglewood, you know, they were all in Southern California. And so from the time of the age of being five years of age onward, I worked in a little retail record store as a little kid. And as a result of that, I was in and around music my whole life. Um, by the time I was 15, I knew I would be a songwriter. And between the ages of 15 and 18, <laughs> I wrote about 200 songs. Oh, wow. um, I joined ASCAP uh, in 1978. Um, I've been a music producer since 1978, and uh, I am the um, basically the last known living partner of Nick Vinay, who produced and discovered uh, the Beach Boys, Linda Ronstadt, Jim Croce, Don McLean, and of course Nick Vinay's favorite artist was um, oh was Bobby Darin. Uh, for those who don't know who Nick Vinay is. He also produced The 2,000-Year-Old Man with Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner. And Nick Vinay was the first producer in the music business in the early 1960s to get music producers a real credit, Robert, off of albums sold. He actually... Wow, that's really good. It was a big thing. He got a 3% royalty for producers um, separate from the deal. Isn't that cool? 
Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, it's unheard of too. So I've been in and around the music business. I was born in 1957. I've been around it since I was a five-year-old. Um, I went on in the 1990s. I started a couple of record labels, and um, then after 9/11, you know, moved to New Zealand. So, but anyway, that's a little bit of my backstory. Wow, that's a uh, that's a really good backstory. Uh, what brought you to New Zealand uh, specifically was is there one singular reason or New Zealand was a very interesting adventure for me Robert and I will openly tell you that um if 911 had not happened I know I can mention 911 on your show Absolutely uh, <laughs> uh, if 911 had not happened uh, I would not have gone to New Zealand uh one week after 911 I was driving to Paramount Pictures. This is a true story with my, I, I'm a father with four kids. And I was driving with my firstborn son up to Paramount Pictures to meet with Cass Warner, who's a, a, a friend of mine. Cass Warner is the granddaughter of Harry Warner, the co-founder of Warner oh, wow. Brothers. And we were going to go have lunch. Uh, this was one week after 9-11. Uh, I was in a car accident with five other cars. Uh, I was driving a 1999 Volkswagen Beetle, one of the newer ones. Uh, my car was totaled. Um, I had a minor concussion. I had a speech impediment. You can tell I love to talk, so I couldn't talk for about three months. Ooh. And um, after I recovered from my mild concussion, to be brutally honest, Robert, I became very clairvoyant. Really? And very, yeah, it was a life changing event. I. I started seeing things. I know this sounds like, I don't mean it to sound like new age psychobabble, but I became very clairvoyant. And once I healed from my injuries, my inner voice kept telling me to get out of the United States. So um, between 2001 and 2005, um, my focus was paying off debt and, and consolidating my life and, and getting ready to leave the country. And that's the honest to God truth of, of how I ended up in New Zealand. And, yeah. Wow. Uh, so when you got to New Zealand, um, you know, we corresponded a little bit before about some of the shows you were involved with over there. Um, what was it that you started doing over there in the music industry? Well, it's really interesting. After we're done with our interview today, Robert, I'd be happy to actually uh, send you the business plan that took me to New Zealand. Uh, I went to New Zealand originally to start a motion picture soundtrack company. And that was my vision. That was my dream. And I put together a small group of investors and I moved to New Zealand. And, um, you know, you're, I was sort of a big fish, a big, big fish in a little pond, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And um, when I was there, I started networking with people. New Zealand is basically a small town pretending to be a country, and <laughs> uh, everyone, everyone knows everyone, Robert. And uh, when I moved there to start my motion picture soundtrack company, uh, I met a guy by the name of uh, Matty Wilson. Matthew Wilson, who was the original composer on a hit television animation show called Bro Town. And um, he also wrote some of the music for it. And I met with Matty, and Matty had um, a beat ulcerative colitis. Um, he was told that he was going to um, probably be dead or have cancer by, by his late teens. Oh, wow. And, you know, and was going to live very long and uh, became a, a cannabis activist and started eating uh, cannabis. And it, it kept him from um, um, wearing a colostomy bag. And um, I ended up producing a, a small budget film for $156,000 called Real and Raw. And I'll send you all the links and all these things so your audience can check it out. They can view it online for okay, free. Thanks. And and how I got involved with reggae music was um, Maddie wanted me to um, uh, put together a reggae soundtrack. So I decided to do that. And then from there, that led me to producing some truth or talk radio. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going too fast. No, but I not at give all. As much information as I can to your audience. So, yeah. So you mentioned um, truth or talk radio. Uh 
who is it that you worked with out there? Um, basically, you know, there's an old saying. It was in the movie uh, Magnolia with Tom Cruise. You may be done with your past, but your past is not done with you, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. and, and so I had, uh, I had been involved with the alternative media, Robert, since 1993. And I thought I was there to do this, you know, this music company. Uh, but then I met a guy um, by the name of Vinny Eastwood, hmm. and um, and uh, Vinny was a very dynamic person. Um, Vinny had a uh, actually had a cannabis conviction, Robert, and that's uh, no good. Uh, actually, couldn't it couldn't leave, you can't leave the country if you have a cannabis conviction in really? New Zealand. By the way, yeah, Vinny cannot. One of the things I've been I've been trying to help Vinny with is trying to figure out a way. Uh, to get him his passport so he can travel, but yeah. So, so long story short, I met Vinny, and um, he was actually co-hosting a show. Uh, the other host had a meltdown, uh, went off the air. Uh, the owner of the radio network uh, offered Vinny his own show. It was a network called American Freedom Radio, which is still on the air, American Freedom Radio. And for two and a half years, Robert, I was Vinny's producer, I booked 10 guests a week for two and a half years. Now think about what that's like. And That's uh, a lot of content. It's a lot of content. And I helped Vinny with his website, and I was his mentor. And so I produced the show from like June 3rd, 2010 uh, until uh, the end of October in 2012. So, yeah, so it was like two and a half years. And then I, and then I came back to America, so... Uh, that's what happened there. Vinny Eastwood is, but I would definitely recommend checking him out, everybody. Uh, very, very unique character. Really, really good delivery. Uh, and maybe we owe that all to you, Mitch. Or did you teach him everything he knows? No, uh, Vinny was <laughs> a diamond in the rough and is a natural comedian and created the Vinny Eastwood show, The Lighter Side of Genocide. And um, uh, it's really, this is all Vinny's talent. I think what I did, I don't did you have a chance to hear any of the interview that Vinny did with George Norrie? I, I did not, because I was traveling all day today. When you hear that interview, you'll hear what I heard in Vinny when I first met him. You know what I mean? And I just figured, and he's so talented. Um, it's really Vinny. I agree. Yeah, it, it's Vinny's talent. All I did was direct that talent. And, um, you know, um, uh, the first two letters in producer is, you know, PR, right. And the first two Absolutely. letters in the word president is PR. So, you know, I, when you're dealing with the alternative media, I'm going to openly tell you, you're dealing in a situation where, um, uh, people kind of need therapy. So I would be the producer doing the show prep, um, to do one hour of syndicated radio for every hour on the air, you actually do one hour of show prep. And so uh, that's, I will openly tell you, I think that's the reason Vinny's show sounded so good back then. But I must tell you, Vinny's show is just as good, if not better, without me producing it. You know what I mean? So it's, I just, I just helped him at the beginning. So. Oh, that, that's awesome. So, you know, you, you left the United States, you went out to, New Zealand, and then you decided to come back. When you started Stoner Studio, what was the motivation behind that? Well, Stoner Studio was, and I so appreciate it. First off, I want to let you know you have an exclusive here because we're actually not launching the show till March. So um, we have not done a public announcement of it. Um, oh, wow. Stoner Studio to me is sort of all the conversations that we can't have with our own family, Robert. And Stoner Studio represents the kind of talk show that is, that is a great divide between cannabis users and non cannabis users, you see. Because if I say to someone like you, um, do you smoke cannabis, right? And then, right. And then you say, yes. Well, and then I tell you, I smoke cannabis, okay? And I started when I was 35. Well, what happens is we start this very authentic dialogue, right? Because some people say you don't smoke cannabis, it sort of smokes you. You know what I mean? 
So <laughs> yeah, I like that one. Yeah. So I found within the non-cannabis community, to be brutally honest, there was too much infighting. You know what I mean? So I, I agree. There, there. First, you have something called cognitive dissonance, right? And it's sort of like you've been taught a certain kind of history or a certain way of thinking. And then one day, Robert, you wake up and you realize that everything you were taught, everything that happened, you were lied to, you know? So then you wake up. So Stoner Studio, again, is, is, a, is a, a very voyeuristic, no uh, holds barred a podcast. And uh, it's going to be different from a lot of things on the air. And uh, we're going to run it at um, Big Reggae Mix on my other project. And I, I think it's going to be a, um, I don't know how big it'll get within the marijuana and cannabis community, but, uh, and, you know, I think it's going to be a very interesting show. We, and we haven't even launched it yet. And I've got people all over the world that are contacting me. I mean, our Twitter account has only been up for about a month and we've got about 1600 followers so far. So that, that's excellent. Yeah. That, that's really good to hear. Um, sounds like you're generating a good amount of buzz without even putting much out there and i'm sure that goes back towards your credibility in the industry and what you've done for it so far uh so is stoner studio kind of an extension of what you're doing with big reggae mix yeah it's um big reggae mix is a real passion of mine it is a 24 hour a day internet streaming music station uh it's programmed by scott t brown our program director uh, I've known Scott for over 15 years. Uh, no one knows more about reggae than Scott does. I mean, um, it is eerie how much Scott Brown knows about reggae. <laughs> um, I basically sort of, I don't know if beg is the right word, Robert, but I, I basically begged him for two years, you know, to, to do a stoner studio kind of show, to, to interview, you know, people within the cannabis and marijuana community. But the truth is, um, he was a music major in college. His real passion is programming, not doing talk shows. And so uh, mm. I had to sort of step up to the bar to do it. But it's Scott who does all our programming. Uh, we stream out of San Diego. And then I realized after we were on the air for a couple of years that uh, we also need to have a voice that's, that's talk driven. So um, Stoner Studio will have two versions. Um, okay. It'll have a, a short form version that you'll hear literally every day on Big Reggae Mix. Uh, it'll be a three to five minute show. Uh, and then it'll have a much longer version that'll not be on Big Reggae Mix. That'll be a lot more of these uh, truther issues, whether it's genetically modified foods or fluoride in the water or Agenda 21 or all the other crap that's going on. Yeah, uh, it can get dizzying sometimes if you start going down some of the rabbit holes out there and trying to put some things together. Uh, biggest rabbit hole for me has been uh, waking up to what we were lied to about cannabis. Uh, you know, I'm a life, not lifelong, obviously I wasn't using cannabis out of the womb, but I've been using it for about two decades. I'm 36, and I knew from an early age that what I was being told about cannabis was was inaccurate. I just had no idea how deep the lies went and how pervasive they are throughout our entire society. Um, in your work, bringing, you know, big reggae mix, doing that, uh, being in the music industry and using cannabis, how has it been breaking through some of those stigmas? Because you've, you've been going at this for a while, so I'm sure you have a good perspective. What I, what I found, Robert, is that uh, as you go further down the rabbit hole, uh, you have to be very, you have to be very open-minded. Um, you know how I mentioned earlier in our dialogue about cognitive dissonance and what that is and how people are, you know what I mean? They're educated yes. to be a certain way. Um, if, are you familiar with the book Propaganda that Edward Bernays? By Bernays? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you've read that book, yeah? I, I have not read the whole book. I'm actually getting a copy of it from my editor on the blog, uh, but I but I know about it. I, I've flipped through it. I've you know read plenty of reports that have been based on I, it. Uh, it's I have the pretty book much the I'm, PR bible. 
I have the book and I'm happy to send it to you after this interview. So it's no problem. Um, wow, that's awesome. That's, uh, you know, that's pretty much textbook for uh, PR. You know, we have been lied to about everything. And if you want to study cognitive dissonance, you know what I'm saying? Um, that is a really great book uh, to read. But I wanted to answer your question. I got a little off topic here. And I'm glad, okay, you're, sorry about I'm that. glad you're going to edit it. It's my fault that I get you off talk, topic because I'm enjoying the conversation so much. Well, um, Mitch, you know, sometimes I, I, I don't mind letting the conversation just kind of go the way it goes. If you don't mind, I, I, I'm i okay with going down whatever rabbit hole it presents us. Okay, no, I, that's fine. That's fine. Um, for me, cannabis, because I started at like 35 and you also started in your 30s, okay? Um, well, well, no, I started, I, I'm 36. I, I've been using for two decades. I started when I was about 13, actually. Okay, cool. Well, that's cool. And for me, I was paranoid of using it and didn't use it till my mid-30s, but um, I appreciate you lowering your standards to put up with, a, you know, an old cannabis user here. So that's good. No, not lowering standards at all. Just um, broadening the scope of the conversation, I think, is what we'll say. Absolutely. No, absolutely. But um, for me, cannabis has been an interesting journey. I, I generally enjoy smoking it. I would say that uh, medically it has really helped me a lot. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm damaged goods or anything, but it, 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 I think, you know, let's put it this way. In 1996, you know, President Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act. And I watched America go from over 50 media companies down to four or five media companies. And uh, it was really sad to see. You know what I mean? I even went to FCC hearings in the late 90s and realized that they were really going to go after freedom of speech, you see. And oh, yeah. And and the problem I saw was that people that were non-cannabis users, you know, there's so much, um, you know, there's cognitive dissonance in terms of us trying to understand how we've been lied to, right? But there's something else that goes on uh, that people need to understand, and that's called the Hegelian dialectic. Now, have you, are you familiar with how the Hegelian dialectic works? A little bit, I believe that is where, you know, problem, solution, something like that. But you could probably explain it better for the oh, listeners. Oh, no, it's, it's fine, and I'm happy to do so. And I ask these simple questions because I don't assume anything anymore. You know what I mean? So here's what the Hegelian dialectic is. And when I share this with your audience, it's going to blow their minds. Ready? The Hegelian dialectic is where the powers that be um, come after you and they give you choices, Robert, but it happens to be their choices, not your choices. So in America, the choices they gave us for the last election, right, were Clinton and Trump. And so this is all they could come up with. Are you kidding me? So that's what happens is they say, okay, you know, we, we, we're a democracy, and we, you know, we're free here, so we're going to, you know, here's our choices. You know, here's 16 candidates, you know, and you choose your choice. So that's the reality of it, is that there is the Hegelian dialectic that is presented to the American people is, is just, you know, it's frosting. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not the real thing. And um, it's a fascinating time. Yeah. Oh, extremely fascinating. Uh, you know, in the cycle of an empire, we're kind of towards the end on this one, because the only thing that's transparent right now is the corruption. Speaking of which, in Florida, our medical marijuana industry, we have a vertically integrated market, and there's only seven producers in the entire state. So s seven companies essentially control the market. Uh, Senator Jeff Brandis, who I had on a podcast of about a week ago, he likes to refer to them as the cannabis cartels. Uh, wow. And, it, and I want to interject something, Robert. Isn't it okay. interesting as cannabis becomes more mainstream, as, as more and more patients are able to get cannabinoids, you know what I'm saying, and get creams to, to alleviate their pain, right? Right. Um, 
as more and more people wake up to it, um, there's also more infighting in terms of who controls it. You know what I'm saying? So, Oh, lots of infighting. And, um, you know, I think that sometimes is part of the old divide and conquer strategy. If we can keep fighting amongst ourselves, me and you, Mitch, uh, whoever is lawmaking can kind of just go on without any type of um, feedback or oversight. Well, here's the interesting thing, too, is that um, the only way to beat this is uh, the only way uh, to win this game is not to play. You know what I'm saying? It's it's to be authentic to who you are, because yes, because what I found within the cannabis community is, see, when I was doing alternative talk radio, that was one level of truth. But once you bring up the whole cannabis issue, you see what I'm saying? Um, Then that's a whole new level of truth. You see. And also, um, for me, I think calling the show Stoner Studio was was sort of my way at flipping a finger uh, at at all the people over the last 30 or 40 years that have given the name Stoner a negative connotation, you see. So. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'm a I'm a rebel in my old in my old age. So. You are. You're a trailblazer, too, Mitch. It's ironic that you said that was one of the reasons you use stoner. That's actually one of the reasons I use marijuana. A lot of the people in the cannabis and marijuana industry are trying to shy away from using the term marijuana because of its ties to a racist past and it being used, um, you know, to kind of badmouth people with a different colored skin Mm. back when Anslinger and... William Randolph Hearst were doing their push to get cannabis illegal. So some people think it detracts from the conversation and doesn't, you know, sound as good because it's not the physical or the scientific genus of the plant. I like to use it because that's primarily what the people from the reefer madness days know the plant as Mm. most of them aren't, you know, you talk to a 80 year, your average 80 year old, grandmother or grandfather and you mentioned cannabis it's likely they may not know what you're talking about um, especially in states where there's no medical marijuana industry Mm -hmm. no i understand Uh, so so this is this is um your feedback about the cannabis cartel in florida is fascinating to me and i'm going to tell you why okay um as as cannabis becomes more mainstream uh both for for recreational uh, and also for medical use, okay? Uh, we have a crisis in the United States at this time. Uh, and that is there are more people in the Northeast dying from heroin overdose uh, than are dying from um, car accidents, homicides, or suicides. And that once again proves to you how the drug cartels just switch from one drug to another, if you know what I mean. So... Uh, Unfortunately, I do know what you mean, Mitch. And it's a very confusing time. And one of the things my mother taught me, God bless her, is that everything is politics. It's all politics, you know? It just is. 100%. Your lifestyle is a political statement as far as I'm concerned. Well, it is, um, unless you're just 100% authentic, which there might be point zero 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 one percent of us there. You know, you almost have to be a saint. Yeah. Uh, because we are. Uh, humans are trying to portray a specific image. And depending on how many times you may have read Propaganda by Bernays, you may be really good at selling a particular image, and it is politicking. You know, when we're having conversations with other individuals, at least in my opinion, you know, we're constantly uh, operating a feedback loop. I totally understand. I totally understand. And if you notice, if you start to go back and and look as an example at every U.S. election in the last, let's say, 30 years or since John F. Kennedy, the reality is it's all a big show. You know, it's, it's all a big show. Yes, it is uh, a big show. Sometimes I like to liken it, what's going on, especially in the cannabis industry here in Florida. It's almost like uh, Vince McMahon has taken over and is directing a WWE show because we have politicians who obviously say that they are with the will of the people because over 71% uh, 
in Florida voted for the medical cannabis industry. Wow. But then these, then these same politicians, I called one yesterday, session here has not started. The political uh, legislative session has not started here in Florida. It will start, uh, I believe, around March 10th. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. It might be off by a week. Mm. And, and somehow this politician doesn't have any meetings for his constituents at all already through the entire session, all the way until the summer. So and, can I ask you a question, Robert? I know it's your show, but I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. This is just a conversation and I just provide the medium. But uh, the question it. I have for you, Robert, is do you think as a, re as a result of the political winds of Florida right now, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry to use the M word, does that mean you might move to another state in order for your own sovereignty and freedom? Because I have friends that have that are moving to California and I got friends moving to Colorado right now. That's a good question. Uh, I've considered becoming a cannabis refugee, but it, man, this is a really tough one for me because I, I'm a patient myself. I have 10 herniated disc and the pain is unbearable and I can't cultivate my own in Florida. So that question is always in the back of my mind. Uh, the reason why I'm probably not going to move to another state is because I th feel that my best work to be done is here in the state, mm -hmm. try trying to bring access to these patients that I talk to on the daily basis. In Florida, for instance, just so you can understand some of the barriers for the patients, not even getting into the business barriers, we have a 90-day wait. So when you go wait see the doctor... Wait a minute, 90 days from the time you see your doctor? Yes. Oh, my God. And, and Mitch, this is even if you're a terminally ill patient. You have to wait 90 days. So you could be in the unfortunate circumstance where maybe hospice is being called in. Uh, cannabis can really help ease your end-of-life transition. It can improve your quality of life. And in some cases, terminal patients have gone into remission if it's something like cancer and, and survived. So when I hear that politicians are okay with and the Department of Health is not only okay but pushing a 90-day wait, it, it saddens me, it uh, confounds me, and... It angers me to some extent because, Mitch, let me tell you, there's not a doctor I've spoke to. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm lying. There's one doctor I've spoke to that was able to tell me no patients have died during their 90-day wait. Every other wow. doctor I've spoke to has multiple patients that have died during their 90-day wait. By the, way, so, by the way, in California, when I decided to get my card, right? Uh, because it just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, in my case, I contacted a company called Hello MD in San Francisco. Uh, they put me on a call very similar to Skype, so the doctor could see me. Uh, okay. My ID was sent over. Um, I spent less than fifty dollars for the card. It was done online on a on, on a camera call, and uh, they issued my card. Uh, within 90 seconds and within 24 hours, um, the dispensary delivered to my doorstep. That's amazing. California's really got it going on. When I moved out there for um, a little over a year, a few years ago, I was in a dispensary getting medication within about two hours of landing because I went, I got my driver's license established. I got my paper temporary ID from the California DMV. I went and spoke with a really cool doctor in Oakland at uh, 420 Evaluations. His name is actually Dr. Toke. And I was able to purchase my medication, like you said, within, for me, it might have been about 90 minutes. And there's no wait. I, I didn't have to suffer. In Florida, unfortunately, that's not the case. And if the 90-day wait wasn't bad enough, Every 45 days under current law, you have to get a new recommendation from the doctor. So that means you're paying another office visit. The majority of the people that are trying to get the cannabis right now in Florida are the ones that are the most debilitated 
and in really dire straits because like it or not, everyone that's listening, the majority of you out there are still using the black market and probably will continue to do so. So the ones that were already purchasing on the black market, they don't really see a need or a want to go spend upwards of $150 per month in some doctor's cases here in Florida to keep that recommendation going. Um, now you mentioned telemedicine. That's another hot hot button topic in Florida right now. They're trying to ban telemedicine for cannabis recommendations, which to me is really sad because there's a ton of elderly and otherwise um, unable to get to a doctor's office types of patients. There's lots of them in Florida, actually. And I had no clue until the telemedicine ban got proposed Mm -hmm. and the phone calls came in, the emails came in, the text messages came in, Mm -hmm. and the tears were flowing from these patients. Because some of them, they don't have anybody. They don't have family members. Some of them may have already outlived all of their friends. And their normal method of getting to their health care appointments is by using a transportation company. But that transportation company is normally getting paid by Medicare. So now we have patients that are indigent and unable to get to the doctor to get the medication that they need. And if they do, it may take 90 days. So that's something that we're fighting for is the telemedicine here in Florida. Um, how, how awesome was that for you to be able to do that, to see your doctor that way? Uh, it was really amazing. And uh, I will tell you... Um, uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, the, the amazing thing is that I was, and I hate to use the P word here, I was I was so paranoid as to how the process was going to work. You know what I mean? And right. um, the thing was, I had a lot of friends that had some really terrible medical conditions, you know what I mean? And had paid for their medical card and had gone in to see a doctor for an evaluation. And I just said, you know what? If I had the guts to move to New Zealand and if I had the guts to, you know, do an openly anti-government radio show, or at least it was, it wasn't, hopefully it wasn't perceived as anti-government, but, you know, I'm a media activist, basically, Robert. So, you know, in producing the Vinnie Eastwood show, this was my way of standing up. You know what I mean? And so... I sure do. And so I was willing to even be a bit of a rebel and I was like the first one within my own tribe or community to do it online, like over a video Skype like call. So, and everyone was like, I can't believe you did that Mitch. And then, you know, I went with this company called hello MD and they granted me my card and I have a physical card in my pocket, but I got the recommendation letter, letter gold embossed ready to go. Literally it was that the recommendation card in the letter, so fast out after the evaluation, it was unbelievable. Yeah, California has really got a good system implemented for getting access to the patients, which is what this is all about. There's something um, else that California did too that you need to know about. Um, when they when they passed the recreational, you know how in this last election uh, they passed. I the sure rec- do. Yes. Well, here's what will blow your mind. Okay. There are places now that if you have your medical card and your you know driver's license or whatever, you just walk in and, and within seconds you have your medicine, okay, um, which is really amazing. But I also want to let you know that California um, is taking a fairly cautious stance on its recreational marijuana. And so it's technically – you've got hundreds of companies in San Diego and Los Angeles and San Francisco – uh, that have either raised money or put teams together or anything else, you know what I'm saying? And um, they are in action, and some of them won't even open their doors until January 2018 because they've seen what Colorado is going through, true or true, and they're seeing what Florida is going through, and they don't want to have that same uh, situation. Definitely don't want to have the same situation as what's going on in Florida. Uh, Now that I've told you a little bit about how it's hard to even get your recommendation, um, how about I tell you about the prices real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some of the products here are well over $100 per gram. Yeah, I just wanted to let that one sink in. Over $100 per gram. Uh, that's 
crazy. That's crazy because um, I bought uh, eight and a half grams here in California. Eight and a half grams. And are you ready for what my total bill was? Oh, sure am. Lay it on us. Ninety-four dollars and fifty cents. So was that a good was that a good price? Yeah, it sure was. Too bad that it's illegal for you to transport it to Florida. That'd be a hell of a return on investment over here. Hey, everybody. This is Robert Roundtree. Sorry about that. We had a little bit of audio difficulties, so I had to cut a portion out. And we're going to get right back into where Mitch and I are talking about the status of the world. Uh, aware, aware of the Star Wars solution. The reality of what I see going on is they've got everybody fighting with everybody. You know what I mean? And sure do. And I have never, um, I've never seen it this bad. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. No, it's it, it's really bad. Uh, you know, we have the race baiting that's going on around the country. We have nearly every group that is of a minority class feeling like they're being assaulted. Um, you know, people are, are generally at each other's throats if we just had to, you know, look at a bird's eye view and see what's going on amongst the masses. Right now, it feels like we're in a soft war where it's really, you know, I always say you can't solve a, a spiritual problem with politics, if you know what I mean. And so everyone is infighting. Um, but I think the time is going to come where it's going to go from being a war of ideas to, to going hot. You know what I'm saying? I, I sure do. Um, and speaking about spirituality... What do you think about cannabis's effects on spirituality and being able to kind of put you in that present moment? And how does that help you with music? Well, I have a I have a joke about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you know the difference? Uh, do you know what my definition is? The difference between being spiritual and being religious? No, I don't. My definition is is this: If you're religious, you're afraid of going to hell. If you're spiritual, you've already been through hell. Wow, that's a really good one, because I kind of have a similar viewpoint, and that is we're in the process right now of transitioning to heaven. If you can get in the present moment in this lifetime and learn to accept life on life's terms, or as Ramdas says, be here now, or Eckhart Tolle, the power of now, you're in heaven. It's blissful. Absolutely, and I always say that you cannot change your past. You cannot um, project, uh, predict the future. You can only live in the ever-present now, which is why they call it a present. And, um, you know, the reason that people always have such fond memories of their past is because they, they don't remember the negative in that moment. They only remember what was going on. You know what I'm saying? So, Wow, that, I had never thought about it like that, but that's, that makes a a lot of sense. Well, I never thought about it that way until I started smoking cannabis at the age of 35. All right. So, but I will tell you, um, see, I also will tell you, um, there's a, there's a negative side on cannabis and I'd like to cover that for a few moments, Robert, if you don't mind. And it's not, okay. it's not to be negative, but it's something I do need to bring up to your audience. Okay. Okay. The big piece with cannabis for me, and I use it every day, OK, um, is that it's very important and uh, very important. And I'm not a medical doctor and I don't claim to be and I'm not giving medical advice. So I want to give a disclaimer. OK, okay. Um, the biggest challenge I see with the legalization of cannabis or the medical use of cannabis is the patient not getting the right strain for them. And yes. because the strains are very, very different, you see. And so. The issue is making sure the patient has the right strain. There's a secondary issue, which is really important. And this is something that bothers me, and I think it's going to change. And what, why am I talking in circles here? Um, we've noticed in California that if we juxtaposition 2014 all the way up to 2017, so if we look at each crop or each you know, brand or whatever it is, okay, um, that okay. is grown and released. 
uh, the strains continue to get stronger and stronger each year, you see. Thank God. Okay, no, I understand. <laughs> I understand. But for some people, they don't need a stronger strain, Robert. And um, for some people, they need a lower strain, a lower um, um, dosage um, because their medical problem is not that great and they still need to mentally function. You see what I'm saying? So. Um, oh, 100 percent. Yeah. So for a lot of people, they might they might need a really nice um, hybrid, you know, that's a little bit more on the sativa side and um, um, still addresses pain, but but doesn't turn them into a zombie, you see. So, yeah, couch lock isn't good if you were wanting to get something done during the day at all. Uh, I'm glad you brought up really common, commonly known issue with cannabis, like you were saying, and that's how user specific it is. Um, even down to the strain, you know, we may have the same condition, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the same strain is going to be the best for our body makeup and our chemistry. And that's actually something I love about the cannabis plant is there are so many strains available and learning how to do a proper dosage titration, figure out your dosing and taking notes about the strains and how they affect you is something I always recommend. Uh, most of the caregivers I know recommend that as well. Mm. Um, but figuring out your proper dosage, especially if you're going to be consuming the medication in an edible form yes. is, is very, very important. I also want to let you know that there's another piece and, and thank you, Robert, for being open to me also going to the negative side, because I think you know me well enough to know I'm not a negative person. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. So I will openly tell you another story that I think your audience will find fascinating. And that is that, uh, one of the, one of the other reasons that we moved to New Zealand was that my wife had breast cancer. Oh, wow. And my wife has been cancer free for almost 10 years now. And, Yay, and that's awesome. Yeah, and she had one of three doctors in the world that does not believe in uh, mastectomy. So my wife did not have her breasts removed. She still has them. Wow. And she had stage three cancer. And we were actually Ooh. getting on the plane to go on vacation to New Zealand when her doctor called me on my cell phone as I was walking down the tarmac to get on the plane to say, you can't go to New Zealand, your wife has stage three breast cancer. Oh, so wow. we decided to take our five week or six week vacation to check New Zealand out um, because I wanted to give my wife hope. And I said, honey, if, you know, we're gonna go to New Zealand and have these six weeks. We've been planning this since 9-11 for a long time and we're gonna go and get you, you know, cured and we're gonna, go, gonna come back from New Zealand, okay? So we went back to America to go through seven months of hell to get my wife. My, it was my wife's decision. It's her body. So right. she actually went through four unbelievable rounds of the most lethal chemotherapy you could ever imagine. Ooh. And um, the, the two things that, that really helped her was she took fermented wheat germ called Ave, which was costing me at the time like $310 a month that I had to buy offshore and it was building my wife's immune system. But the other thing that saved my wife was that she was able to get some incredible medical cannabis. Um, this particular strain was called knockout yeah. and it would help her after the chemotherapy treatment so she could sleep. Okay. Because she was in that much pain. Well, wow. As a result of using cannabis and cannabinoids um, during her cancer therapy, which was, the chemo was four months, but she had radiation. She had all, she went through the whole freaking thing, man. Oh, man. Um, it was a year of hell total. But what I wanted you to know is this, um, that once my wife recovered from her cancer and is in full remission now, um, even though I'm, I have a medical marijuana card, uh, my wife can't use it. Uh, she doesn't particularly like the smell of it. Oh, wow. Um, it's too strong for her. And without meaning to insult your audience, it reminds her of her cancer, you see. So we have a household with, with, you know, with a husband, me, who's got a medical card and a wife who doesn't use it. 
Okay, but we love each other. We've been married for over 30 years, Robert. So, you know, excellent. Yeah. And we had four kids. So I'm just letting you know that there are circumstances where a patient will use medical cannabis and it does help them with the healing. It does help them get over their medical problem. But at the end of it, they make a conscious decision to not use it anymore. And that's okay too. Absolutely. Um, and for a lot of people, that may be even a really significant portion of the people that are going to use medical cannabis will be using it in that manner because uh, it does have some psychoactive properties and it definitely does make you feel different if you're using something with a high THC content in it. Uh, the low THC, high CBD stuff isn't going to give you any type of psychoactive properties. Uh, or effects. So I, I definitely agree that there's going to be a significant portion of people that use cannabis. They they heal themselves with it. Um, probably a lot of cancer patients, like you're saying, undergoing the chemo and radiation therapy will be using it to help with sleeping, with pain, with uh, appetite. It it helps them it helps them with everything, Robert. We both know that it helps them with everything. And here's the oh, other yeah. piece. And now I'm going to use the F word. And oh, boy. What you think it is. <laughs> I, was, I was living in New Zealand in March of 2011 when something called Fukushima happened. Okay? And I was sitting at my uh, home studio, and I was literally crying at my keyboard. And I was like, oh, my God, there are plumes of radiation going all, all over the western part of the United States. Oh. And what Americans don't understand is there is a, a radiation and cancer pandemic in the United States, Robert. And this is not some conspiracy theory, okay? I know a lot of people that are dealing with cancer. Right now. So... It's another reason why I have a medical cannabis card is because of the fact that I want to have some cannabinoids in my blood. I want to have some THC in my blood um, because it does protect you from, guess what, radiation and Fukushima. It, it sure so, does. Uh, it, it's a neuroprotective and it is also under patent by the U.S. government for being a neuroprotectant. Do you know about that patent? I don't know about the patent, but I do know about the K2 um, synthetic uh, cannabis that was used where it turned all these uh, patients into zombies. Yes. Uh, in Florida, we've had a lot of that. Uh, but just to circle back to the patent, it's U.S. patent number 6630507. And this is a patent that the United States government has for cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. It was actually filed in 1999 on, guess mm. what day? April I have 21st. no idea. Yeah, really wow. close to 420. And, and the original wow. assignee on it, is the United States of America as represented by the Department of Health and Human Services. Wow. Yes. Wow. And, and so we'll have all of that in the show link, and I will uh, send you a, a copy of the link that I'm looking at on the Google Patent site so you can look into it. Um, it even says right here. I'm going to read verbatim for everyone listening. Cannabinoids have been found to have antioxidant properties unrelated to NMDA receptor antagonism. This newfound property makes cannabinoids useful in the treatment and prophylaxis of, wide, of a wide variety of oxidation-associated diseases, such as ischemic, age-related, inflammatory, and autoimmune diseases. The cannabinoids are found to have particular application as neuroprotectants. And then it keeps going. But... So we have a government that's sitting here saying there is no medical benefit to cannabis. They have it scheduled one, and they own the only two existing patents on cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Yeah, and the, and the challenge that you have, Robert, is that um, it, it's, um, it's a culture where when you're dealing with a medical issue, you just want help. You know what I mean? And you just right. want relief. And um, I will tell you, um, 
there's just so many benefits to it. So now, so now you now you understand why I'm starting this whole stoner studio thing. By the way, Robert, you have an open invitation anytime as the host of your own podcast to be a guest on my show after the launch in March. Wow, excellent. I really appreciate that and, and definitely lo- look yeah. forward to it. Uh, since you brought up Stoner Studio, let's uh, talk a little bit more about what Big Reggae Mix is doing and then how, you know, are you going to be using like m- music that you create for the show? Because I want to get in and talk about some music stuff because that... I love music. Well, the, the thing we might consider doing is maybe schedule me for a part two on the music stuff. Because okay, once I great. start on the music stuff, that'll be another hour. So um, <laughs> I can I can um, I can talk to you briefly about it if you like. But um, it's really how I met uh, Bob Marley's engineer Errol Brown uh, was doing the real and raw reggae soundtrack, you know, in New Zealand, and uh, we became very good friends about. I'd say about 2010, 2011, and uh, stayed in touch. And then, and uh, Errol Brown has won five Grammy Awards, and he's produced over 45 Errol Brown's Reggae Legend Show uh, that we run every Saturday and Sunday on BigReggaeMix.com. So, uh, to answer your question, BigReggaeMix.com, the whole purpose of a 24 hour day. A uh, reggae radio station is using the power of reggae and the power of healing with cannabis. You know, our our byline at BigReggaeMix.com is the global healing has begun. So it sure has. You know, cannabis is hands down, in my opinion, the single most beneficial organism for humans. I mean, just hands down. Uh, because do you know? Do you know that that Maddie Wilson? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I got to share this with you. That's okay. Maddie Wilson saved his upper and lower intestine, having the doctors pull it out of his body and giving him a, him a colostomy bag, because every oh, wow. day he drinks a green smoothie with a giant indica bud in there that he whips into the smoothie and eats it, and because of just doing that every day since he was a teenager. He still can eat and digest his own food. That's amazing. The uh, the things that people are able to cure and treat as far as gastrointestinal problems through juicing the live cannabis plant is amazing. THCA, for those of you that are listening, that's uh, the component that gets converted into the Delta 9 THC, which everyone loves so much. But if you just use THCA through juicing cannabis, it has amazing properties for the body. It, it is very, very beneficial. Um, but the reason why I say that the plant is hands down the single most beneficial organism is because the medical part of it is just one piece of the puzzle. Then we have the industrial uses for cannabis. You can create plastics Mm. with it. I could create Mm. uh, fuel Mm. to put in my vehicle and drive it. Uh, The industrial uses for construction materials. Uh, Are you familiar with like uh, the concrete Mm. or hardy Mm. board? Yeah. Well, they make a hemp board. Hemp, hempcrete, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also a bioaccumulator. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that property of it, but they Mm. actually use industrial Mm. cannabis and planted it around the site at chernobyl Mm. what it does it absorbs all the heavy metals and the toxins and it doesn't leave the land fallow so you can actually just replant 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 over and over again absorb correct and it's just amazing uh every time you ride an elevator mitch for the most Uh. part you're being suspended by hemp the the oh steel rope that you see is just a sheath around the hemp core. And I found that out from a buddy of mine who has been repairing elevators for 20 years. Yeah, it's mind boggling. So to think that we live in a country which is an agricultural juggernaut and we have to import this stuff because industrial wow. hemp or industrial cannabis is legal in the United States if it has less than 0.08% THC by volume. It's just illegal to cultivate it, so they force us to import it. Uh, luckily, there's states like Colorado, Washington, and others that are starting to allow people to 
produce it as an agricultural commodity and for industrial uses. Well, you're very up on this, young man. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. This is my passion. Um, I started my blog, uh, you know, I said a little bit in some of our dialogue online a, a few years ago, and it's just, it's amazing. The people I talk to every day, uh, people like you, people like the patients, the, uh, the advocates, I mean, it's amazing. Every day I hear a new story of challenge and survival through whatever circumstance. It's always something new and, and something amazing. And I just love to be able to offer a platform for discussion and dialogue mm. with individuals like you that are doing things to bring awareness to cannabis and offer that to my audience. Yeah, so we've been going now about a, an hour um, right now. I would like to plug all of your different sites and stuff. Oh, yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, uh, if people want to hear Big Reggae Mix, it's just bigreggaemix.com. Um, uh, as I am the producer of the station and also the co-founder, and uh, I do blog there. Um, three to five times a week. So if you go to bigreggymix.com and you click blog, you'll always see little write-ups written by Mitch Santel, co-founder of Big Reggy Mix. And uh, we stream on uh, iTunes. Uh, we're, we've got over 38,000 uh, followers and registered listeners at TuneIn Radio. And um, we're just building this huge following, and, and we're very much tied into the cannabinoids and the cannabis marijuana community because we're playing reggae mix, you know, reggae music all day long. So, I mean, nothing goes better with it than, than some good reggae music. Uh, I mean, there's a big festival they have here in Orlando, and it's called Reggae on the Block. And, uh, mm. man, that's one of the few times... You can just smell people openly using cannabis in downtown Orlando, and the police don't say anything because they would have to arrest the entire damn festival. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and um, you know, that's why I say, you know, um, you're, you're like I am in the fact that you're a media activist. You know, you've decided, you know, to not just use it as a medical u user, but to actually stand up and blog about it and do a podcast and get your name out there. So I really applaud and honor and acknowledge you, Robert, for what you're doing. And I so appreciate you reaching out to me. Uh, Big Reggae Mix has been a, a labor of love um, to work with five-time Grammy Award winning record producer Errol Brown, um, who's produced... The guy's produced over 360 plus albums. Wow. I got to watch him mix live at the one love reggae festival in long beach california at the at the queen mary uh and uh it's a pretty amazing thing one second okay thanks jenna uh yeah so it's and then errol does his show um each and every saturday and sunday we run it from 12 to noon it's called errol brown's reggae legend show so and a lot of the times on his show, depending on the show, happy to send you a sample of it. Um, he not only covers reggae, he covers different genres within reggae, like dub reggae, roots reggae, you know, um, a dubstep, uh, you know, different forms within the reggae community. Uh, my favorite form of reggae is what's called reggae pop. Uh, if you ever get a chance, listen to a band called Revolution. Oh, I love Revolution. And OK, and listen to an album that Errol Brown produced called Count Me In. Okay. And um, it is probably it, it's still reggae music, but the album was produced as pop reggae. And so it, it has a it has a feel like it could be on mainstream radio. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Revolution is really good. Um, my wife is the one that actually got me more into the reggae music scene when I met her. I'm uh, as I mentioned to you. In email, uh, I produce house music kind of as a hobby. I, uh, you know, had a few, <clears throat> a few indie labels put some music out on Beatport and some other places, iTunes and Amazon. But I was always a fan of reggae, you know. But my experience with reggae was limited to Bob Marley and Peter Tosh, and so to mm -hmm. see all the mm -hmm. new things that are going on in the reggae community and all the subgenres, it's just really great. The creativity, uh in my opinion, couldn't be at a, a bigger boiling point right now than um, 
it's ever been in, in that in the music industry period and that's because a lot of people like myself are able to produce at home there's been a lot of great records come out that started with a producer at home in a home studio uh and i will do something that will blow your mind when we hang up from this podcast i'm going to send you a picture that was taken of me with al anderson al anderson who is the original guitarist for the whalers and it's me and al anderson and errol brown the original engineer and producer of the whalers and this picture was taken just days ago in long beach california so I'll send that to you. Yeah, that would be excellent. Uh, any type of good photos like that, I would love to get so I can put them in with some of the short form content we extract out of the talk and also on the YouTube channel so we can have a good, yes. have us a good little uh, slideshow playing in the background. Yeah, no, it's really great. I so appreciate the opportunity and I want to wish you the best of luck, Robert, with your show as well. I think uh, it's great. Thank you, Mitch. I, I appreciate you coming on. This has uh, been a great conversation. The only issue I have is, man, I, we don't have enough time in the day. I could probably talk back and forth with you on a range of issues <laughs> for a very, very long time. And we'll get into some more of that in the future. And I just want to let you know I appreciate everything that you're doing uh, for music because I'm an artist and for cannabis and for raising awareness to it and also raising awareness in general, to some of the issues that are going on in our country and the world at large. Absolutely, and I appreciate you stepping up in a state that is so restrictive, unlike California. And it's crazy around here. You know, there's a Japanese saying, the nail that sticks up gets hammered, and uh, I've been sticking up for a while, and so have all the people around me that are helping, uh, either with my organization or other organizations we work for, and we've just decided that enough is enough, and realize we really have to fight to get what we want and for those of you that listen in we're going to be fighting for you until we have no restrictions left on this plant zero it needs to be treated like a tomato that's great well you know what i'll tell you what's interesting i'd like to leave your audience with with an interesting thought okay okay you wake up to the truth when it affects you personally you know that's it. So if you're anti-cannabis or anti-medical marijuana and you're like, you're, you know, you're so proud of how anti-drugs you are, then all of a sudden you get a medical problem and the only thing that relieves it is cannabis. Believe me, you're going to jump on the Robert bandwagon and say, I, I'm in too much pain. I need relief. Absolutely. It's of my opinion at this point, if you're anti-cannabis, you're either evil or you're ignorant. And at this point, you're choosing to be ignorant. So if you're one of those ignorant folks, um, I can't do much for the evil ones. But if you're ignorant, keep tuning into what we're doing. Follow people like Mitch and Stoner Studio and, and learn the truth. Educate yourself. There's nothing wrong with this plant. It's It can benefit you one way or the other. Um, your endocannabinoid system needs to be nourished and that's it. A well, a well of this marijuana solution. Please join FloridaMarijuana.net and the Marijuana Solution Show at the Florida Medical Cannabis Conference and Exhibition on May 19th to the 21st of 2017. This exciting medical cannabis event is being held at the Saddlebrook Resort and Spa, just north of Tampa in Wesley Chapel, Florida. The conference covers many facets of the growing Florida cannabis industry, including expert presentations on new medical research, brain health, legal considerations, and financial topics. You can visit their website now at Florida Medical Cannabis Conference.com or get more information by calling 850 558 0609. Early registration discounts are offered until April 15th, 